Well, as I just said, computer memories supplied by the semiconductor manufacturers are finite, and that's quite a pity. Uh, it might not always be that way. Just for a quick calculation, you can see that it's possible that if memory prices keep going down at the rate they're going, that if you it took, still took a microsecond to do a cons, then first of all, everybody should know that there's about pi times 10 to the 7th seconds in a year. And so that would be. Uh, 10 to the 7th plus 10 to the 6th is 10 to the 13th. So there may be 10 to the 14th constants in the life of a machine. If there was 10 to the 14th words of memory on your machine, you'd never run out. Okay, so that would be, and that's not completely unreasonable. 10 to the 14th is not a very large number. Okay, <laughs> and even for, <laughs> I don't think it is. <laughs> but then again, I, I like to play with astronomy. So, is at least 10 to the 18 centimeters between us and the nearest star. But the, the thing that I'm, I'm about to worry about is, at least in the current economic state of affairs, 10 to the 14th pieces of memory is expensive. And so I suppose that we have to do is make do with much smaller memories. Now, in general, when we want to have an illusion of infinity, all we need to do is arrange it so that whenever you look, the thing is there. Right, and that's, that's really a, a, an important idea. Uh, a person or a computer lives only a finite amount of time and can only take a finite number of looks at something. And so you really only need a finite amount of stuff. But you have to arrange it so no matter how much there is, that you, no matter how much you really claim there is, there's always enough stuff so that when you make a look, it's there, and so you only need to find an amount. But let's, let's see. One problem is, as was brought up, that there are possible ways that, that there is lots of stuff that we make that we don't need, and we could recycle the material out of which it's made. An example for, is, for, is the fact that when we're building environment structures, and we do so every time we call a procedure, we build an a environment frame, that environment frame doesn't necessarily have a very long lifetime. Its lifetime, meaning its usefulness, may exist only over the, the invocation of the procedure. Or if the procedure I exports another procedure by returning it as a value, and that procedure was defined inside of it, well, then the lifetime of the frame of the outer procedure still is only the lifetime of the, uh, pr of the procedure which was exported. And so ultimately, a lot of that is garbage. Okay? There are other ways of producing garbage as well. Uh, users produce garbage. An example of, of user garbage is something like this. If we write a, a program to, for example, append two lists together, well, one way to do it is to reverse the first list onto the empty list and reverse that onto the second list. Now, that's not a terribly bad way of doing it. Okay? And however, the intermediate result, which is the reversal of the first list, as done by this program, is never going to be accessed ever again after it's copied back onto the second. It's an intermediate result. It's going to be hard to ever see how anybody would ever be able to access it. In fact, it will go away. Now, if we make a lot of garbage like that, and we should be allowed to, then there's got to be some way to reclaim that garbage. Well, what I'd like to tell you about now is a very clever technique whereby a Lisp system can prove a small theorem every so often of the form, the following piece of junk will never be accessed again. It can have no effect on the future of a computation. It's actually based on a very simple idea. I mean, we've designed our computers to look sort of like this. There is some data path which contains some registers. You know, there are things like x and n and val and so on. And there's one here called the stack, some sort, which points off to a structure somewhere, which is the stack, and we'll worry about that in a second. There's some finite controller, 
finite state machine controller, and there's some control signals that go this way, and predicate results that come this way, not the interesting part. This is all, there's some sort of structured memory, which I just told you how to make, which may contain a stack. I didn't tell you how to make things of arbitrary shape, only pairs. But in fact, with what I told you, you could simulate a stack by a big list. I don't plan to do that. It's not a nice way to do it. But we could we might have something like that. We have all sorts of little data structures in here you know, that are hooked together in funny ways. Okay. And they connect to other things, and so on. And ultimately, things up there are pointers to these. The things that are in the registers are pointers off to the data structures that live in this list structure memory. Now, the truth of the matter is that the con entire consciousness of this machine is in these registers. Okay? There is no possible way that the machine, if done correctly, if built correctly, can access anything in this list structure memory unless the thing in that list structure memory is is connected by a sequence of data structures to, to the registers. If it's accessible by legitimate data structure selectors from the pointers that are stored in these registers, things like array references, perhaps, or console references, cars and cutters. But I can't just talk about a random place in this memory, because I can't get to it. These are being arbitrary names I'm not allowed to count at least as I'm evaluating expressions. If that's the case, okay, then there's a very simple theorem to be proved, which is if I start with all the pointers that are in all these registers and recursively chase out marking all the places I can get to by selectors, then eventually I mark everything that can be gotten to. Anything which is not so marked is garbage and can be recycled. Very simple cannot affect the future of the computation. So let me show you that in a particular, in a particular example. Now that means I'm going to have to append to my description of the list structure a mark. And so here, for example, is a list structured memory. And in this list structured memory is some list structure beginning at a place I'm going to call, um, this is the root. Now, it doesn't really have to have a root. It could be a bunch of them, like all the registers. But I could cleverly arrange it so all the registers, all the things that are in all the registers, are also, at the right moment, put into this, into this root structure, and then we got one pointer to it. I don't really care. So the, the idea is we're going to cons up stuff until the, our free list is empty. We've run out of things. Now we're going to do this process of proving the theorem that a certain percentage of the memory has got crap in it. And then we're going to recycle that to grow new trees, a standard use of, of such garbage. So in any case, what do we have here? Well, we have some data structure, which starts out over here in P5. And, well, sorry, it starts out in 1. And in fact, it, uh, it has a car in, P, in 5, and its cutter is in 2. And all the marks start out at 0. Well, let's start marking just to play this game. OK? So for example, so since I can ac access 1 from the root, I will mark that. Let me mark it. Bang. OK, so that's marked. OK, now, since I, can, since I have a, a 5 here, I can go to 5 and see, well, I'll mark that. Bang, that's useful stuff. But 5 references as a number in its car. I'm not interested in marking numbers. But it's cutter is 7. So I can mark that. Bang. OK? 7 is the empty list, only, the only thing it references. Uh, and it's got a number in its car. Not interesting. OK? Well, now let's go back here. I forgot about something. 2. See, in other words, if I'm looking at cell 1, cell 1 contains a, contains a 2 right over here, a reference to 2. That means I should go mark, mark 2. Bang. 2 contains a reference to 4. It's got a number in its car. I'm not interested in that. So I'm going to go mark that. Uh, 4 all refers to 7 through its car and is, the, is empty in its cutter. But I've already marked that one, so I don't have to mark it again. This is all the accessible structure from that place. 
simple recursive Mark algorithm. Now, there are some unhappinesses about that algorithm, and we can worry about that in a second. But basically, you'll see that all the things that have not been marked are, are places that are free, and I can recycle. So the next stage after that is going to be scan through all of my memory, looking for, looking for things that are not marked. Every time I come across a marked thing, I unmark it. And every time I come across an unmarked thing, I'm going to link it together into my free list. Classic, very simple algorithm. So let's see. Is that very simple? Yes, it is. I'm not going to go through the code in any detail, but I just want to show you about how long it is. Let's look at the mark phase. Here's the first, here's the first part of the mark phase. We pick up the root. We're going to have to do some, uh, we're, going to, we're going to use that as a recursive procedure call. Uh, we're going to uh, sweep from there after when we're done with marking. And then we're going to do a, little, a couple of instructions that do this checking out of the marks and changing the marks and things like that according to the algorithm I've just shown you. Okay, it comes out here. You have to mark the cars of things. And you also have to be able to mark the cutters of things. That's the entire mark phase. I'm going to tell you a little story about this. The old DEC PDP-6 computer, this was the way that uh, the mark sweep garbage collector, as it was, was written. The program was so small that with the data that it needed, with the registers it needed to manipulate the memory, it fit into the fast registers of the machine, which were 16, the whole program. And you could execute instructions in the fast registers. This is an extremely small program. And you can run very fast. Now, unfortunately, of course, this program, because of the fact that it's recursive in the way that, in the, in the way that you do something first and then you do something after that, you have to work on the cars and then the cutters, it requires auxiliary memory. So Lisp, Lisp systems, in other words, it requires a stack for marking. Lisp systems that are built this way have a limit to the depth of recursion you can have in data structures in either the car or the cutter, and that doesn't work very nicely. On the other hand, you never notice it if it's big enough. And that's certainly been, that's certainly been uh, the case for most uh, MacLisp, for example, which ran Maxima, where you could deal with expressions of thousands of elements long. These are algebraic expressions with thousands of terms. And there's no problem with that. Such a garbage collector does work. On the other hand, there's a very clever modification to this algorithm, which I will not describe, by Peter Deutsch and uh, Shor and Waite, Herb Shore from IBM and Waite, who I don't know, uh, where that, al that algorithm allows you to build, you do, can do this without auxiliary memory. By remembering as you walk the data structures where you came from by reversing the pointers as you go down and crawling up the reverse pointers as you go up. It's a rather tricky algorithm. The first time you write it, or in fact, the three, first three times you write it, it has a terrible bug in it. Uh, and it's also about, uh, it's quite rather slow because it's complicated. It takes about six times as many re memory references to do the sorts of things that we're talking about. Well, now, once I've done this marking phase, and I get into a position where things look like this, let's look, yes, here we have some, here we have the mark done, just as I did it. Now we have to perform the sweep phase. And I described to you what the sweep is like. I'm going to walk down from one end of memory or the other, I don't care where, scanning every cell that's in the memory. And as I scan these cells, I'm going to link them together, if they are free, into the free list. And if they're not free, I'm going to unmark them so the marks become 0. And in fact, what I get, well, the program is not very complicated. It looks sort of like this. It's a little longer. Here's the first piece of it. This one's coming down from the top of memory. I don't want you to try to understand this at this point. It's rather simple. It's a very simple algorithm. But there's pieces of it that just sort of look like this. They're all uh, sort of obvious. And then after we've done the sweep, we get an answer that looks like that. Now, there are some disadvantages with mark sweep algorithms of this sort, serious ones. One, one important disadvantage is that your memories get larger and larger. Okay. If you say address spaces get larger and larger, and you're willing to represent more and more stuff, then it gets very costly to scan all of memory. Okay. What you'd really like to do is only scan the useful stuff. It would even be better if you realized that some stuff 
was, was known to be good and useful, and you don't have to look at it more than once or twice or very rarely, whereas other stuff that is not, you're not so sure about, you can look at in more detail every time you want to do this, you want to garbage collect. Well, there, there are algorithms that are organized in this way. Let me tell you about a, a famous old algorithm which allows you to only look at the part of memory which is known to be useful, and which happens to be the fastest known garbage collector algorithm. This is the minsky fenichel yokelson garbage collector algorithm. It was invented by, by Minsky in 1961 or 60 or something for the RLE PDP-1 list, which had 4,096 words of, of, of list memory, okay, and a drum. And the whole idea was to garbage collect this terrible memory. What, what Minsky realized was the easiest way to do this is to scan the memory in the same sense, walking the, the, the good structure, copying it out into the drum, compacted. And then when it was the, we were done copying it all out, then you swap that back into your memory. Now, whether or not you use a drum or another piece of memory or something like that isn't important. In fact, I don't think people use drums anymore for anything. But uh, this algorithm basically uh, depends upon having about twice as much address space as you're actually using. And so what you have is some initially some mixture of, of useful data and garbage. So this is your called from space. And this is a mixture of crud. Some of it's important and some of it isn't. Now there's a, another place which is hopefully big enough, which we will call two space, which is where we're copying to. And what happens is, and I'm not going to go through this in detail, it's in, it's in our book quite explicitly, there is a, uh, a root pointer you start from. And the idea is that you tra start with the root, you copy the first thing that you see, the first thing that the root points at, to the beginning of two space. The first thing is a pair of some, or something like that, a data structure. You then, you then also leave behind a broken heart saying, I moved this object from here to here, giving the place where it moved to. This is called a broken heart because a friend of mine who implemented one of these in 1966 uh, was a very romantic character and called it a broken heart. <clears throat> but in any case, the, the next thing you do is now you have a new free pointer, which is here, and you start scanning. You scan this, you scan this data structure that you just copied. And every time you encounter a pointer in it, you treat it as if it was the root pointer here. Oh, I'm sorry, the, the other thing you do is you now move the root pointer to there. Okay, So now you scan this, and everything you see, you treat as if it were the root pointer. So you see, if you see something, well, it points up into there somewhere. Is it pointing at a thing which you've not copied yet? Is there a broken heart there? If there's a broken heart there, and it's something you have copied, you just replace this pointer with the thing the broken heart points at. If this, is not, if this thing has not been copied, you copy it to the next place over here. Move your free pointer over here, okay, and then and then uh, leave a broken heart behind and scan. And if eventually, when the scan pointer hits the free pointer, everything in memory has been copied. And then there's a whole bunch of empty space up here, which you could either make into a free list if that's what you want to do. But generally, you don't in this kind of system. In this system, you sequentially allocate your memory. Now, this is a very, very nice algorithm, and sort of the one we use in the, the scheme that you've been using. And it's, it's known to be uh, as expected. I believe it's, no one has found a faster algorithm than that. There are very simple modifications to this algorithm invented by Henry Baker, uh, which allow one to run this algorithm in real time, meaning you don't have to stop to garbage collect, but you can interleave the consing that ma the machine does when it's running with steps of the garbage collection process so that the, thing, that the garbage collection is distributed and the machine doesn't have to stop and garbage collect and start. Of course, in the case of of machines with virtual memory where, where a lot of it is in inaccessible places, this becomes a very expensive process. And uh, there have been numerous attempts to make this much better. There is a, uh, a nice paper for those of you who are interested by Moon and other people 
which describes uh, a modification to the incremental minsky fanshawe yokelson algorithm, a modification to the Baker algorithm, which, uh, which is more efficient for virtual memory systems. Well, I think now the mystery to this is sort of gone. I'd like to see if there are any questions. Yes. I saw one of you run the garbage collector on the systems upstairs, and it seemed to me to run extremely fast. Yes. Did the whole thing take, yes. does it sweep through all of memory? In, no, in it, sweep, it swept through exactly what was needed to copy the useful structure. It's a copying collector. OK. And, it's rather, and it is very fast. Uh, on the whole, I suppose, to copy in a bobcat, to copy, uh, I think, a couple of a, a three or f three megabyte thing or something is less than a second of real time. I mean, really, these are very small programs. One thing you should realize is that is that um, garbage collectors have to be small, not because they have to be fast, but because no one can debug a complicated garbage collector. A garbage collector, if it doesn't work will trash your memory in such a way that you cannot figure out what the hell happened. You need an audit trail. Because it just rearranges everything, and how do you know what happened there? So this is the only kind of program that it really is seriously matters if you stare at it long enough so that you believe that it works. And that means, and then you sort of prove it to yourself. And that, that there's no way to debug it. And that takes, that takes it being small enough so you can hold it in your head. So garbage collectors are special in this way. So every reasonable garbage collector has gotten small, and generally small programs are fast. Yes? Repeat the name of this technique once again. That's the Minsky Fenichel Yokelson garbage collector. You got that? Minsky invented it in 61 for the RLA PDP-1. A version of it was, was developed and elaborated uh, to be used in Multix Ma MacLisp by Fenichel and Yokelson okay, in uh, somewhere around 1968 or 69. Okay, let's take a break.